Romans chapter 12. By the way, let's just get a witness. How many Bibles do we have here tonight? Would you hold them up? Now just take a minute and look around. I'm telling you, that's beautiful. Praise God, that's nearly everybody in the house. The devil don't like that, but I do. Amen. Romans chapter 12. And now that you've found your place, let me refer you back to chapter 11 in order to bring up to where we are in the message tonight. Paul says, as we go back to, say, verse 30, you, as in times past, have not believed God, yet you have obtained mercy through their unbelief. Now, if that makes a lot of sense to you, then okay, but I need to explain that a little bit. He's talking to the Gentile church, and he says the only way you got in is because the Jewish people wouldn't believe God. And because they refused to receive God, God turned from them and has made you the recipients of his grace. You got in because somebody else wouldn't go in. You got in because God in mercy looked upon a people who were not a people, a people who were estranged from God, a pagan world, and he said, because my people won't listen, heed, obey, I'm going to turn the gospel to another. How sad that someone is offered a gift and they won't take it. How sad that not only will they not take it, but they trample it under their feet. Not only will they not take it and they trample it under their feet, but they mock the one who offered the gift. That's the nation of Israel as they turn their back on God. Now he says, verse 32, for God hath concluded them, the end of all things, he has concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. That means that the Jew and the Gentile is now afforded the mercies of God. Now, as Paul writes this down, the Holy Spirit's telling him, you see, what to write. And as he writes this down, suddenly an exclamation of praise comes out of his heart. And he cries out, as is recorded for us in verse 33, Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Now let me just pause there long enough to say to you, when God offers a blessing and it's refused, that blessing becomes a curse. Are you listening? Case in point. The nation of Israel was given the gospel. The Levites were given the responsibility of evangelizing the world. They failed miserably in carrying the light of God to the far corners of the world, to the people of the world. As a result, God said to them in the book of Isaiah, he says, you who are given the responsibility to evangelize are going to yourself be evangelized with people of stammering lips. In other words, from people from around the world, they were going to evangelize the Jews. So their blessing was turned to a curse. When God offers you his mercy, you need to accept his mercy. Else it... On the day of Pentecost, we are the fulfillment of that prophecy. When the gospel is given to the people that day, there were men from all over the world, devout men, Jewish men from all over the world, 
who spoke many different languages and they all heard the gospel in their own language. And so now the curse that is upon them is turned again to a blessing. For they hear the gospel and 3,000 of them got saved on that first day. When I read that recently, I about jumped out of my seat. I had never seen it before. That these were not the, the gutter people, the, but the Bible says these were devout men. These were the top of the line. These were people who were faithful to the synagogue, who had come to the city to worship in the temple. But when they heard the gospel of the resurrected Lord, 3,000 of them got saved. And my heart ran to this verse and said, Wow, the depths of the riches of the love of God and his ways and his judgments are past finding out. Now, he says, since I have given you grace, since I have given you mercy, since I have extended to all who will hear the opportunity to know me, now we come to verse 1, chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now he turns his attention to the church. Not to those who have rejected, but those who have accepted. What is our responsibility as a Christian? What is God's word to every person who is in this room tonight who names the name of Jesus? What is his command for your life and for mine? He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, if you're saved, say amen. amen. Now that puts us all in that same verse. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, that you present your bodies as living sacrifices. Now let me break it down a little piece by little piece. I beseech you. That's the most powerful word that the Holy Spirit could have chosen at that point to make his point in the verse. I beseech you. Paraplio is the Greek word. And it's a word that you would use if you uh, lived in a two-story house. And your mother lived with you. She's an invalid. And she is confined to her bed. And you take care of her every day. Everything that she needs, you do for her. If she needs a bath, you bathe her. If she needs food, you feed her. If she needs water, you bring it to her. Everything that she does is right there in that upstairs room in your house. You love her. So on this occasion, you say, Now, Mother, I need to go down to the store. I won't be gone. And I won't be gone just a few minutes, and then I'll be back. But as you make your errand and you return, when you near your home, you see that there are cars all over the front of your house, in the road, up on the lawn. Smoke is billowing out of your house. And you realize your mama is trapped in the flame. As you leap from the car and you run across the lawn to try to get into the house and up to the stairs to bring her out, a strong neighbor grabs you and says, you can't get in. We've already tried. The stairs are engulfed in flames. And up there in that upper room, you can hear mother crying, Help me! Help me! And you say, but I've got to get to mama. You can't get there. The flames have cut off any access. About that time, a fire truck pulls up. A fireman steps out. He's got on his special gear. He has the ladders that will allow him to reach the upper room where she is. And you rush to him and you say, Oh, Mr. Fireman, I 
beseech you, there's that word, paraclio, with all of the fervor that is in you, Use whatever training you have. Use whatever equipment you have. Use your bravery. Go into the flames and bring her out. Now, when the Lord is making his point here, that's the word that he chose. It's the word you would use if you were uh, at the doctor's and the doctor says your son, your daughter will not live unless they have this operation. But this operation is so expensive that insurance companies won't pay for it. And you file on your knees and you say, Oh, please, doctor, please, whatever the cost, don't worry about it. Give him the surgery. That's the word. I beg you. Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, the matter of Christian experience is never to be taken lightly. The walk with the Lord is not a casual walk or stroll down a rose-lined lane. But the walk of the Christian is of such importance, of such content, that the Holy Spirit of God says with all the fervency that is able to be mustered into one word, I beg you, I beg you, that you present yourself as living sacrifices. Now, please note, there are those people today who say, Oh, preacher, I'd be willing to die for the Lord. He had all the big sacrifices he wants. He had uh, 1,500 years of that from Moses until Jesus. Now, he says, I'm looking for people who are willing to live as sacrifices for me. Do we know what it means to sacrifice? Listen to me now. My brother, my sister, I want you to know that most of us do not understand in the least what sacrifice is all about. I ask people every now and again, how about fasting with me? Oh, wait a minute, preacher. You mean I'm going to have to give up a meal? Why, I'll starve absolutely to death. By the way, did you know that after you have been on a fast for three days, that your body begins to break down the fats in your system and turn them back into sugar so that you can eat them up? Some of you could live six months off of the fat you got stored up. <laughs> I beseech you. <laughs> Sacrifice. Oh, not that preacher. Ask anything, but don't ask me to give up on my groceries. Well, how about let's make a special offering to God? Well, let's all them rich people. They're the ones that's supposed to be given. Let those that had to pay... $100,000 in income tax last year. They're the ones that ought to give. Could I remind you that the greatest gift recorded in the Word of God was by a woman who gave two mites. I beseech you that you'll give yourself as living sacrifices. How about going visiting with me? On Thursday night. Well, now, preacher, you just got to understand. My program comes on on Thursday night. What program is that? Well, the Braves are playing. Or uh, I don't know what comes on, but you do. <laughs> Reruns, yeah. So we got all of the things in a line. No, I beseech you that you present your bodies as living sacrifices. People who are willing to accept, if need be, the ridicule of the community. People who are willing to forfeit the comfort of their home. People who want to say, God, because of your love, your mercy given into my life, I want you to take all that I am and let me be used up for God. As one great preacher of another day said, God, let me burn out, but don't let me rust out in my life. 
living sacrifices. It's that kind of spirit that brought John Knox to his knees and he cried out, Give me Scotland or I die. It's the kind of spirit that took the young preacher and put him out there among the American Indians and at age 28 died and went to be with God because he had lived in the cold and sat in the snow and slept under those conditions until his body was total, em, totally emaciated but he left behind a work that goes on till this day. Let me burn out. For God, I beseech you. Who will do sacrifice yourself for God? Well, I ain't got past the first word, and I'm just, uh, time's gone. The plea that the Holy Spirit makes here is absolutely beyond my understanding. He says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God. Why should we do that? I want you to look at that now because I went back to make sure that I knew what I was talking about. And when he says by the mercies of God, he's referring to those attributes of God that are manifested in your life and mine. The first of those would be grace. You see, God gave you grace that saved you. He gives you grace that keeps you and sustains you along the way. And if you didn't have anything except that, that you'd say, oh, I'm willing, I'm ready to give myself up for God. It, just the fact that God gave you grace. You see, you weren't saved by your works. You weren't saved because of your bank account. You weren't saved because of your looks. Man, if we were saved on the basis of looks, I'd be lost. <laughs> Turn to the person next to you and say, you're uglier than I am. <laughs> no. You see, folks, if, if you're basing your salvation on how you look, how you talk, where you were born, what you've got, what you do, you've got something to brag about. But God says you're saved by grace through faith. And so, based on that alone, you ought to give yourself as a sacrifice to God. How about his goodness? I just noticed there a while ago as I flipped through the Psalms that the Lord uh, reminded me that he loads our wagon every day with benefits. God is good to us. Wow, everywhere you look, God's just got some new thing he's just dumping into your life. Just the blessings of heaven that he gives to you. All oh, praise be God for his mercies and his goodness and his long suffering. Now, most of us would have to confess that we didn't get saved the first time we heard the gospel. As a matter of fact, some of you can tell how you ran from God. And why you thought God wasn't seeing you, you did a lot of stuff that you wish that you'd never done today. My boyhood friend called me yesterday, and as we talked, Pee Wee said, us boys that's raised up over there at Easley Mill were rough customers, weren't we? Said, so we did a lot of things that we wish we hadn't have done. But I thank God, he said, that Jesus saved my soul. See, I look back, and what I see back yonder, I don't like much. As a matter of fact, there's some things probably in my yesterday that when I examine them, I don't like some of what I saw. But God is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish. If you want an example of that, read the Old Testament and look at the nation of Israel who turned their back on God. I mean, God would say, worship me. And they say, hallelujah, God, we'll do it. And the next time you look, they're over yonder at the temple of Baal, worshiping him. They're playing footsie with every God that you can find. They're burning incense and, and doing all kind of abominable things, including offering their children burnt sacrifices to their gods. Oh, have mercy. But God said, I love you. 
and he'd send an oppressor and bring them back to himself. And they'd turn back for a little while. They'd go right back and do the same kind of ungodly things. But God was merciful. And even to this day, God says that they're special to me. I've got a plan for them. And he is working in their lives even today. But I bless God that he looked down and he saw me. And I said, God, I'm glad you love me, but I got some things I got to do. Some wild oats I've got to sow. Now, if I'd have been God, I'd have said, oh, all right. Isn't that the way we work? I love you if you'll love me. But God said he's long-suffering. I'm glad God's pressure. He called and he called again and he called again and he called again. But oh, I bless him for that day when before him I bowed and cried, God be merciful unto me a sinner and save me for Jesus' sake. God gave Israel opportunity after opportunity to repent. Now I've got to conclude, but let me just give you one further illustration. In the book of Jeremiah chapter 18, you have the story that's recorded there by the man of God that he went down to the potter's house. God said, I'm going to teach you a lesson. And he sent him down to the potter's house. And he watched as the potter took that clay. And you know what you have to do? I, I'm not a potter, but I have, I have worked a little bit with that, just playing with it more than anything. Uh, but you know what you have to do to get the clay ready? You get an old lump of clay, it's hard. And it will not yield to the hands of the potter. But that potter takes it and he pounds it. And he pounds it. And he rolls it. And he kneads it. He presses it. He presses it. And he rolls it. And he presses it. And the more he presses it, the more of his body heat goes into it. And the more pliable that clay becomes until finally he's got it to the point that he wants it. And then he takes it and he, what they call throw it, he puts it in the center of the wheel. And then he takes his foot and begins to work that treadle. And that wheel begins to turn. And the skilled hands of the potter begin to fashion a vessel that he has in his mind that he wants that clay to become. And it's only the potter who knows what is in that lump of clay. It may be a pot to use in the kitchen. Or it might be a vase that will adorn the hallway of a mansion. But only the potter knows. And he begins to skillfully work. And as he works it, if there has been some bit of foreign matter left in the clay that went unobserved, and it will not yield to the potter's hand, then he takes it and squashes it, finds that piece of debris and extracts it, works it again, and then starts all over. Have you ever felt like that God was having to start over in your life? Working you, working you, working you, working you. At first you said, no God, I don't want that. No, I don't want that. But finally you say, okay God, whatever your will for my life is. And God begins to fashion us. And as he does, there's some part of me, some old ugly thing in me, some old vile habit, some old thing that keeps me from being what God wants me to be. Maybe he had me designed to be something wonderfully special. But I said, no God. And finally, he has to crush me and start all over again to get me to where I'm usable. And you know what happens when the potter has worked and worked if the clay still won't yield, if the clay will not become what the potter has in his mind for it. He will lift it from the wheel. He'll go to the back door of his house and open it and cast it out. And if you look through the back door of the potter, there's a field. There's broken pottery everywhere you look. Old shards of pottery sticking up from the ground everywhere. All of them was clay that wouldn't yield 
to the master's hand. Broken lives left along the highway of life. Broken dreams scattered along the way because they wouldn't yield to the potter's hand. And by the way, what did they buy with the money that Judas brought back? They brought the potter's field. Broken lives scattered along the way because they wouldn't yield to the master's will. God has a very special plan for your life. God has already in his mind, his understanding, what you were put in this world to be. The blueprint for your life is more wonderful than you can imagine. And sometimes when the pressure comes, it's not Satan, it's God working to fashion you. Perhaps at this point, he's trying to enlarge your capacity. At another point, he may be narrowing your life so that you'll become a vessel that he can use. Maybe you'll hold the oil of the Spirit that's going to be poured out onto somebody else. Perhaps you'll be a vessel where he can wash the feet of another. Perhaps you're going to be that one that will hold the beautiful roses for the rest of the world to see. But God has a very special plan. No wonder he said, I beseech you, I beg you. Based on what God has given you in his mercies, yield your life to him as a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable. Let's pray.